So on this week's episode of Be More Super, the podcast, we welcome back an awesome guest. He's a creator, showrunner, director and writer of Warrior None on Netflix. It's Simon Barry. Simon, welcome back to the show, sir. Good to be back, Brian. And thanks for that introduction. Of course, it's it's not just me. It's a, an entire army of people writing and directing and making that show. So as much as I appreciate the, uh, the, the confidence, I'm just a, I'm just the, the ringleader. Of, of the whole circus <laughs> and i've been trying to get as many of them on the show as possible uh you know in front of the camera and behind the camera because as rightly so it's a massive team effort and the team is just marvelous in what they've achieved it's just outstanding it's fantastic but i wanted to say first of all congratulations on having uh i've got a little slide here to to put up congratulations on the high, one of the highest rating shows on Netflix uh, with 100% uh, from the critics and 99% for the audience. I mean, that must feel amazing as a showrunner to have a show have that much of a response. Yeah, it's very, it validates the work that you put in for sure. Um, and it makes you, I'm particularly, I'm, I mean, the critics, it's lovely to get critical uh, reviews, but I'm more, I think, elevated and uplifted by the fan reaction and the audience reaction that we gave them something that they wanted and that they enjoyed and were entertained by and challenged by. And, and uh, that's very satisfying, of course, because I've made shows where that doesn't happen. <laughs> so, and it's not this, and it's a very different feeling. So this is, this is lovely. But you, but, but you've had quite a few shows that, you know, has had a massive fan base like Van Helsing and and critically acclaimed, you know, um, Bad Blood as well, which which I I thought was an awesome ser series. So don't cut yourself short. And obviously Ghost Wars as well, which yeah. I think's amazing. And it's just been shown on Crackle, uh, I I I think. And that again is an awesome show. It really really is. So you obviously have got the Midas touch. Um, with Thanks. with the majority of them so season one left us uh on a cliffhanger and what a cliffhanger but wow we got a kick-ass season two and you started um filming season two in the pandemic so how challenging was that compared to filming season one and what were the biggest challenges you had to face well season it's funny because season after season one uh we loved shooting all around southern spain and so much in season one that season two the plan was to really we were going to take the show on the road if you will we were going to do a show that kept the cat and mouse part of the story moving and that we were going to try and shoot in all these different locations uh, over the course of season two and of course with with covid netflix put the hammer down and said nope you're not <laughs> moving you're staying in one place and that's it and you'll only be able to go and shoot a drive away from that hub. Mm. No overnights, no travel. And so Madrid became sort of our, uh, our de facto um, studio in a way because we couldn't move from Madrid. Uh, we could just find things in the Madrid area that were, were suitable. So we had to sort of rethink how the story was going to unfold and we had to bring it into Madrid as more of a, a central location as opposed to a traveling show. Mm. So um, that was the one big change. Story-wise, though, it didn't really affect us from a point of view of story, but it did affect the way we shot because obviously the mass protocols and the uh, COVID costs that are attached to the cost of making the show makes everybody nervous about the, the the cost of making TV because you're already on this, you know, you're already being told as a producer, you have to bring in the show at a certain price point with a certain number of audience members for it to f be a good formula for us, mm. right? And so when you already know you're riding that uh, razor's edge of profitability or at least acceptance, to find out that you're going to have to spend, you know, 15 or 20 percent more on COVID costs terrifies you because you think, how are we going to how is this going to be mitigated in the formula of our success? And also you worry about, you know, just people getting sick, people mm. that you work with and care about and you don't want to put them in a position where they are um, at risk. So all of those went into, you know, all and then just the the uh, the issues of 
uh, working with masks and and working in environments that are inherently you know dangerous, there's always just an added layer of stress and on whatnot. We were, I would say, compared to other shows I heard anecdotally about, uh, we probably fared very very well because we we had minimal disruptions compared to other shows, but we did have major disruptions in our little world that really did throw us for a loop and forced us to make, you know, very quick decisions and change things around um, in ways that were not planned. And that's always on a film shoot. It's always when you have to drop the plan that you Mm. really get nervous and scared because (laughs) the plan is really your security blanket. And when you have to throw it out, you realize that um, chaos is suddenly taking over and not necessarily the best way. So was there any Tom Cruise moments um, on set at all? Or did everyone, everyone behave properly? No, I mean, we, we didn't have to yell and uh, tell anyone off <laughs> at all. Uh, people were very well behaved. The nice thing about Madrid, of course, and shooting in the summer was that most life was outdoors mm. in terms of your social, your non-working time. So it was that gives you at least the illusion of safety because most of those restaurants you're you're sitting in in fresh air and you're not in an enclosed space so that part i think definitely gave us a an advantage because you know we weren't asking people to go into places or at least we weren't asking them at all if you went out for dinner or went out with friends after work you would probably more than likely be in a place that was indoors and outdoors and you could choose to be outdoors which is good it must be so nice though filming now compared to the pandemic times uh, things must flow a lot easier now uh compared i don't to know then. because i only shot i've I, I haven't been on a set since season two so I, oh, no. <laughs> I don't know i mean i did go i've i have visited other sets and it's still i think there's still an awareness that the the, the pandemic the virus needs to be taken seriously on a mm. work site because especially in film, if an actor um, is, uh, is, is down with COVID, it shuts you down as a production. Uh, there's no, there's very little you can. So I think people still are taking it pretty seriously. I think because I, the insurance companies have told them they have to take it seriously too. Well, I, I, I suppose you can see it in the way of stunts. You know, that's the reason why we have stunt teams because if one of the actors get injured during a yeah. stunt, you know they're out of action and that costs money and then it yeah, extends shoot time so in season two we get introduced to some new faces uh jack and mina to name a few uh, you were heavily involved in the casting uh, you know in season one what was casting like casting those characters for season season two i mean how did it go it was very smooth i must say i think um <clears throat> you know when you have a great a casting team, which we have in Suzanne Smith and um, Lucy Lennox. Suzanne was based in London. Lucy is based in Barcelona. Um, we we really they, and they worked very well together, combining their resources of finding the best and, and undiscovered, you know, talent in Europe. So, uh, if you can start there, everything kind of is affected by that decision. And those those two. Uh, casting directors are so good at what they do and bring you such a great um, bounty of talent that it actually, what I like when I'm making choices is I have a very hard choice to make. I, I get, mm. you know, I get, I feel very good when I, it's either a very, very obvious choice or a very hard choice because everyone's so good. Now, you're always hoping for the obvious choice. And with certainly with, um, with Jack, um, he was the perfect blend of, someone who we wanted as a performer who had the chops to deliver this kind of performance, but he also had the, the look that when the audience found out who he was, that he was actually, you know, um, Jillian's son, Michael, that they would go, oh yeah, I totally believe that that is the grown up version of that little boy. And that's a very, that when you're casting, obviously two things that are criteria for the audience. Um, one being that they're an amazing actor and two that they feel like they're legitimate uh, based on the story that's really great so we were lucky and and very grateful for that Mina was immediately shone out as an amazing option for Yasmin um, right out of the gate she just brought this light in her she's like that in person she Mm -hmm. has this 
beautiful, um, buoyant uh, a- approach to life that is that translates perfectly to Yasmin. So that was a, that was a, a no brainer as well. And um, and um, and then we got very lucky also with uh, Sadika, who plays Sister Dora, who came comes in late, but was uh, an incredible stunt talent that we had asked her to, you know, we're, we had to sort of say, hey, we need someone who can do what you do as a stunt performer, but, you know, also become this this character that needs to kind of show up at the end, at, near the end and and really um, make a mark. And so that was a, a lovely discovery too. Um, so all of those, that whole process is always rewarding when you know you've got, you found somebody and they found you and it's gonna be a, a, a great relationship. I mean, it's great casting, I've got to say, and the character's just awesome. I mean, if you ever get stuck on an idea for your next project, I was chatting to Mina, and she was saying that when they flew in uh, for filming, they had to isolate for a certain amount of time. And she would spend every day every day on the balcony and she would be talking to Jack from the distance um, and then I just had this thought of a movie based on two people you know during pandemic that fall in love you know over the balconies <laughs> but they never meet in person so if you ever you ever, you ever get stuck you know who to cast there uh, Mina yeah. and Jack so do you feel it helps um, casting sort of unknowns uh, and, and, and I say that in the most affectionate way because you know when you get these big named actors do you think it helps for the believability of the characters to cast maybe people that are not as well known as you know some actors out there well i guess aesthetically and sort of um from a point of view of um keeping the the magical realism of the show alive yes but it's also i mean a lot of times it's an economic reality. You know, it's not something that you are uh, necessarily always saying, oh, this is, this is a, 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 a function of like a strategy. It's usually driven by, you know, a pot of money that you have and how much is left in it. And also whether you can, I personally like it. I, I, Mm. I'm the kind Mm. of filmmaker that loves to find new talent and embrace it and elevate it and, bring it to the world. I think that's so much fun. And, but at the same time, I also love working with, you know, actors who are known because they're so good at what they do. I mean, when I worked with Vincent D'Onofrio, it was, a, a, every day was a pleasure because he's so committed and, um, and talented and, uh, and just has this amazing approach to the, the process that uh, it's great. But I think that on a show like Warrior Nun, in particular, a show that is in this uh, uh, fantasy universe, if you will, as a mythology that is its own, it is, I think, easier to keep this sense of re- of a, a sort of a realism, if you will, when you're not distracted by an actor who has been in a zillion other things, and um, you're you cr- you can, I think, create a more lived-in world you know, in a way that feels a bit like its own thing, you know, it's mm. its own world. It's, um, it's not a derivative of something else. Um, and I want to mention also Richard Clothier, who played um, uh, Cardinal Foster, he was, when he, when he auditioned, he did a, a self tape. And when he auditioned, he did the most amazing thing in his audition that I had to leave my office and go and bring people in to show them what he had done in his audition, which was just this phenomenal transition uh, in in one of the scenes that, and he's amazing to work with as well. Um, so yeah, I think that, and also for me, I just feel like these actors also come with this um, uh, head of steam. They want to they prove to you and to the audience that they are, you know, worthy of this opportunity and worthy of the show and and that's exciting too and i think you just get a really committed uh passionate performance uh in those situations um Mm. and i have worked with some actors of note you know who aren't always you know not as a director or as a showrunner but when i was a cameraman i worked with some actors who kind of because of their fame or their notoriety i felt didn't 
push as hard maybe as the director wanted them to and didn't give you know uh, uh, the kind of uh, effort or focus that might have been might have made the show better you know it, you, you have i've seen that and you don't want that on your set ever no no of course of course not but um i mean looking at season two we only got eight episodes um and yeah. david hater uh i had on the show recently who? david who uh, yeah yeah david um sorry Never something to do with him. snake um i felt really <laughs> bad i met him in manchester just before chris christmas and literally his line at this convention was a mile long so I thought I'd wait in line because I wanted to invite him on the show. And I went up and I wanted to get him to sign something. And literally, there was nothing. I, I wanted him to get, get him to sign something, war, 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 warrior none. And all I could see on this table was Solid Snake. And I've never played the game and I felt so guilty. Um, so luckily, I found a Watchman picture. So I had to get that signed, of course, because that is an epic epic yeah. mo mo movie indeed and he mentioned that netflix only budgeted um eight episodes so bearing in mind that you've mentioned previously uh, that you wrote season two back in may 2020 if i'm right in yeah. saying how did that affect you know telling of the story knowing that it it, uh, it went from 10 episodes to eight well, we knew it was going to go to eight in the writing room um, because mandate the Netflix mandate was not it wasn't a budgetary thing. It was Netflix was shifting all of their shows to eight episode seasons, uh, their studio shows, I should say, not the shows mm. they acquire and re and broadcast, but the shows they make in house as a studio. So we knew that Netflix had decided to make this shift across the board. It wasn't um, it wasn't something that Warrior Nun was. Um, uh, being punished for or anything, we we were just trying. We were long and existed long enough to see, see it go from ten to eight for yeah. everyone. So it really just at the end of the day becomes a function of how you break the story. <clears throat> Typically in the writing room, you know how the show's going, the season's going to begin, you know how it's going to end, and you fill in the the middle as it relates to plot and character, so that each of those chapters is propulsive and entertaining and delivers enough information to get you to the next one. So breaking it down into eight versus 10 really just was a function of what was required. It didn't really change the story we had in mind. It just meant we compressed it into, mm. um, into eight hours instead of 10. <clears throat> so as far as that went, it really didn't have a big impact, I think, on us from a storytelling point of view. <clears throat> The good thing was we got the same budget from season one into season two, so we could spread the money over eight episodes instead of ten, which meant that every episode got a little bit more um, mm. in terms of the budget So because we were amortizing um, that amount. And, you know, it was important also because we needed that extra money because Madrid was more expensive to film in than southern Spain and also because we were dealing with the pandemic, which added, you know, hidden costs as well. So it helped us. But from a storytelling point of view, I mean, it's always nice to have more episodes because, you know, you, you want to have more story to tell. But it was very, uh, it was part of the process from the beginning of season two's writing. Uh, mm. So it was, never, it was never something we had to grapple with. I mean, you often see shows that, that you often think actually could, could, could be slightly, you know, shorter. It feels like... Yeah they're sort of stretching that elastic band uh so i've got to say season two is definitely you hit the ground running and it didn't stop for for, for any of the episodes it really didn't and for this season i've got to say lilith's um, story arc i just thought was incredible and her character is just amazing i mean you know what did you think of that story arc in the, from the writer's room to how it came on screen and which character for you in season two was the most fun to do to develop you know on screen yes <clears throat> well Lilith we knew I think early on that Lilith's arc based on what happened to her in season one was something that would we could really go somewhere interesting with it and do something that was a bit unpredictable and surprising for the audience <clears throat> plus the kind of supernatural nature of what happened to her meant that we could have some fun with you know mm. things like the wings and her ability to teleport we, we knew we wanted to like invest in that and push it into the show in a way that gave lilith 
her own story, her own journey that was as interesting as we could make it, which I think we accomplished. And I think it was nice for um, for Lorena also to be, even because she unfortunately she gets kind of separated from the main group, which is sucks when you're mm. part of an ensemble. But at the same time, she, the spotlight was on her in a way that might not have been otherwise. So it gave her an opportunity to put to stretch and to do things that I think she might not have been able to do if she'd stayed part of the ensemble. So I think that was a satisfying thing. I mean, uh, the question was, which character did I enjoy the most? Mm. Like, um, <clears throat> it's a tricky question because there's so many. It's very hard to pick one um, because they all have their moments, you know. Um, and you all and you, <clears throat> we really wanted to find ways to bring everyone's character into a bit of sharper focus with. Mother Superior and her flashback story and how she lost the halo and then with her near death experience and with Camilla, you know, taking on the role of being much more front and center in the group, uh, obviously with Ava, because she was oh, the whole season was built around Ava being more of a action hero and a more more um, deliberately invested in the uh, the plot direction she she controls the way the story is told much more than in season one i mean everyone kind of had i think an interesting arc and i love the way that christina and through beatrice d that relationship developed mm. in a slow way it's really hard for me to pick one and the i think the reason it's hard to pick is because we spend so much time trying to make sure no one is let down no no single character is left to you know wander aimlessly in the show we're always trying to make sure that everyone is serviced so i can't really pick one i mean i think in terms of at the end of the day, when I watched season two, I do love the Lilith sequences in a way because the, each there's they are all very um, different in the sh context of the show. So it takes you out of kind of the the main <clears throat> story in ways that I think are really fun and entertaining. And you know, because of the difficulty of shooting some of her scenes because of the VFX component of teleportation and the wings, it was the most challenging stuff to shoot in some respects. And that is fun for me personally, as a, as a, a nerd and a technician on top of being a storyteller, I like the, the technical challenge of being mm -hmm. able to do sequences like the end of episode one, where she's teleporting through those guys and killing them all. And then the fight with the wings with Ava, uh, it's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a puzzle you have to crack uh, on many levels with a group of people that you love to collaborate with all trying to solve the same problem with you, which is also a lot of fun. I mean, I've got to give a massive shout out to Michael uh, Black Blackbourne and the embassy because the work that they did, <laughs> you know, each episode is like literally movie it's it's literally the the effects uh the visuals i just thought was stunning in every way the wings and and my fa favorite scene was that fight scene uh with lilith um with 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 her teleporting the way that that was shot was just off the scales it's just another level of epic it really really is i mean i do i dare say that season two there was more action sequences than season season yeah. one because it felt like that when I was watching it. Because yeah, I think we had the ability in season two to have more action per episode per hour than we did in season one. In season one, I think we had to spread it out a bit more in terms of the. Um, I mean, we had some bigger action in season one for sure. The the, the Crusades sequence um, with the uh, with the the castle at the end of in episode 10 was certainly a much bigger action sequence than we did in anything in season two, but the complexity of action in season two and the, and the amount of action we had in season two definitely was, it was more in terms of volume. Yeah. Mm. And For which, sure. and which one was the most satisfying to see from page to screen, it, you know, um, to I deliver think the church. Though the church fight was less defined on the page. It wasn't, so the church fight as written was not written as a continuous kind of um, exercise in, in shooting, like trying to maintain this kind of flow. Mm -hmm. It was written as really much more of kind of a story fight that it got you from A to B before the Tarrasque showed up. In the prep of that 
we all as a team recognized that there was that the story, the story of the fight as written had not given it anything particularly special as on the page. So we all sat around the table with uh, Cassia, the director, and Lee and Kuko and Kai in the stunt department, myself, and um, and we talked about how we could make this fight interesting visually in a way that wasn't going to require a ton of, you know, changes, you know. Mm. And the one thing that we that we came up with was this idea of like trying to keep this seamless connection of because you have three different people fighting, it allowed for these opportunities to keep the action flowing from character to character and thus not breaking it up and having too many cuts. So that I can't remember where that idea came from. It might have been Cassia, the director. It might have been um, Lee or the stunt guys. It might have even been me. I really don't remember. It's such a blur, that whole process. But we all definitely knew that something needed to be added to make it special and make it memorable. And that was the that was a nice way of solving the problem. And that's what happens in prep a lot. I mean, people obviously talk about the production as being what happens on set. But the reality is, is a lot of the best stuff happens in prep when you're mm. planning and figuring out how to not just squeeze all of those pages into seven or eight days of shooting, but also how to make each scene stand on its own and pop and, and feel special because you always want a scene to feel like it's, it's the most special scene every scene is. So when you come up with a solution like that on the fly with you know only a few days to prep it and to plan it, that feels really good. And you feel great at the end of the day when you go, oh my God, it worked. You know, it actually, it actually worked. It um, definitely and, did. It, yeah, so I was very happy that that turned out the way it did. But I'm always I, happy that anything turns out because I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I'm the worried parent every day going, oh, my God, what have I gotten these poor people into? <clears throat> have I asked too much? Have I not gotten enough money for them? I mean, any time a scene plays out and you're like, oh, my God, it actually turned out OK. I'm thrilled. <laughs> 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 and it's like you just don't want to fail. You know, mm. you don't want the audience to fail. and You don't want to have to cut something out because it didn't work, which is what normally happens is if a sequence doesn't turn out the way you want it or isn't as good as you hope you oftentimes just remove it and it's never mm. seen and that's always painful and we didn't have to do that in season two at all <laughs> good i mean as as you know i've interviewed quite a few stars from the front of the camera as well as the awesome people behind the camera and when i've asked every single one what was it like to work with simon they've literally all said it's been amazing. I've got here that um, they couldn't praise you enough as a leader and your openness to the creativity. So what is the secret of running a successful team? And how did it, how did it feel to wear so many hats along the way? Well, the, the, the honest answer is laziness. <laughs> I can't do, I literally cannot do it all myself and I'm not good enough to do it all. So I need a super strong group of people around me who are as talented as they can, I can possibly find. Uh, I mean, I think I'm, I'm good at letting people do their jobs and getting out of their way. I think that's probably the translation of what you've heard is that by, and that's why I call it laziness, but it's not laziness really. It's just me picking well. I, I choose people well and I know that they can deliver uh, to the degree that my expectations and my standards will, you know, will be satisfied. So I think that when you have people like that, it's easy to be uh, trusting. It's easy to be supportive. It's easy to be a leader, not a boss, you know? Mm -hmm. And by leading, I just mean by giving, solving, helping them out wherever I can, solving their problems, answering their questions and lending support where, however I can. But when you have great people, it's, you, you do less, which is better for me because I don't want to be working 20 hours a day. I want to have like a normal life. Um, so I really <laughs> try to empower everyone I'm working with because I trust that they are going to be better at their job with my support than with my, you know, um, than with me trying to micromanage them, which, mm. you know, I try to give them the, the I try to give everyone my hopes and expectations and 
dreams of what I what it could be and what I want it to be. And it's up to them to sort of find a way to deliver that um, without me trying to tell them how to do it or, or, or what to do. I mean, but I do like being a, um, uh, a source of support or, and a source of inspiration if I can, you know, uh, because it is hard. I, I do think I'm good at visualizing what the end result needs to be. And I can communicate that to people who, when they read the script, don't necessarily know what I have in mind. Mm. And I need to be able to communicate that. So clear communication, open communication, transparency, all of these things go into essentially encouraging your team to do their best work, not just for me, but for them. You know, I want them to be proud. I want them to go home feeling like would they hit a home run, you know, mm. and that's I know how that feels having been on that side of of the crew of being a, 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 a grunt a worker be how good it feels when someone trusts you to do your job and you do a good job and you go home feeling like you accomplish something. It's a very good feeling. Even if it's a, a small thing on a movie or a big thing, it's a, it's a good feeling to know your work is appreciated and, and, uh, and you've done well. I mean, obviously shows on camera, um, you know, the work that gets done behind this, behind the cam, 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 camera, it really does. Um, I wanted to touch uh, just slight, slightly on, um, let me see if I pronounce this right, Ava Trace, Ava Trace. Uh, literally, I do apologise, the fans are going to kill me right now. Um, but obviously, this has impacted the internet. The internet literally blew up uh, because you gave the fans exactly what they want. Did you ever think that it, it would have made this much of an impact when you was filming that scene with Beatrice and Ava? Um, I knew that was, I think, I think I hoped it would, <laughs> I hoped it would play out in a way that was, um, I mean, we wrote, we wrote all of season two before season one came out. So we didn't know the impact Ava Tris would have with the fans, but we were trying to, we were still trying to be honor. We were still trying to honor where the characters were going in this journey of their relationship. Mm. And we knew we didn't want to do it too quickly. We knew we wanted it to be a uh, organic earned moment as opposed to a forced one or something mm. that was just for, you know, to get uh, clicks. And I think that the, the satisfaction of it being of blow, of it seeing it blow up was because it felt, I think because people felt it was authentic. Mm. And I think in that authenticity, that's the, the satisfying thing. It's not the volume of clicks or the reaction. It's the fact that people were genuinely moved. You know, they felt like it was a, a moving moment and it had emotional power, which is all we think about on the day. When we're writing it or planning it or shooting it, all I want is for the audience to believe that this is, is a truthful moment and that it's done well. You know, it's done mm. with with respect and with um, uh, a sense of importance that is not over, you know, overbearing or, or pedantic or, you know, just false. You know, you want it to feel like uh, a, a, a moment where, and we're all fans of storytelling. We all know the moments that make us choke up and make us feel emotionally connected to characters and to stories. And you just, as a filmmaker, you're always trying to hopefully achieve that when you're mm. doing it yourself so as a writer and a director it's terrifying because you think oh my god is this i know the actors can do it it's like can i do it can i pull it off is this mm. going to work with the music with the shot with the blocking and is it going to work in the context of the whole journey that got us here mm. is this kiss mm. going to mean what i hope it means and it was nice that it did for the audience because i can't tell them that this is I'm putting everything into this basket. <laughs> I hope it doesn't blow up or fail because it can. And I've seen it has, you know, you know that there's the potential for that. So, yeah, yeah, it's very less. I'm less interested in the. I mean, I love that the audience use the Avatris hashtag as kind of a way to to broadcast their affection for the show. I think it's great. But it's more important for me that that individual person in their moment of watching the show that it had an impact on them. That's mm. more, that's what I'm out to do uh, in my job more than trying to create a, a, an internet sensation or a, a Twitter <laughs> storm. That yeah, exactly. Like at all. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it was great for the representation to have that on the screen, but it was done in such a normal, real, honest way. 
uh, and it doesn't take away from the show itself. And it was just done beautifully. And you know, it wouldn't matter if it was a you know a straight couple, a queer couple. You know yeah. that that would have worked for for anyone. And uh, you know, it's just fantastic. I mean, I've got two small girls, so for me, I want them to grow up watching things that just seem natural and honest so you know not you know not to be sort of influenced in a way that is unnatural if you know what i mean um you know i want them to watch that's sort the of... very, yeah, yeah that's the that's the way it should be and it's it's also actually a great lesson as a writer that you can't replace the truthfulness of characters journeys and ev evolutions with something that is a slapped on statement about you know um sexuality or mm. or mm. orientation because that's not good writing good writing mm. is that you serve the character you don't serve an agenda good writing is that that moment is earned and feels real not that it needed to be in there to make a point the the day i put a scene in that involves uh anything that is you know pandering to an agenda is the day I fail as a writer to my character. My characters, I've failed them, mm. you know? So it's gotta be a character choice. It's gotta be a character journey that is earned and real. And then it feels natural because the characters are living that experience. It's not me making a political statement, which I'm, yeah. I wasn't, I was making a character statement. This is love and it's real and it had to be expressed at this moment because it could it might never be expressed again and that's just that for me is like that puts you in the place where you're going i'm working for these characters i'm working for the audience so that they know that these characters are being treated with respect and if the byproduct of that is an honest loving moment that's that's not standard great i take it i love yeah. it because <laughs> that's the way the world should be and then i wanted to <clears throat> move on uh to uh marketing of the show <laughs> which has been talked about quite a lot. So I'll be honest, I don't know how it works with Netflix, uh, but I'm part of the Netflix Media Center. So when Netflix season one came out, I saw it before everyone else that, that there's a show coming out called Warrior Nun. I got all the backstory, the photos and everything like that. With season two, it never appeared on the Media Center. It never appeared um, anywhere. Uh, I mean... We, were you aware that this was going to happen or was this a a choice that netflix made or was it just a, a bundle uh for them <laughs> well it's ultimately i do not get involved uh directly with netflix in terms of uh setting an agenda about marketing because they uh especially on a show that is one of their studio shows which we are a show that they de that we developed internally that they are the they are the uh, they have the sole financial responsibility for. Um, I trust that they will come to me with whatever they need from me or share with me as a showrunner and as the uh, as someone who gets to uh, represent the show and answer questions or whatever it is. So typically, I'm not read into their strategy in advance, other than the basic things like you know, they're going to put up a trailer at this time, or they're going to release some key art at this time, or here's the release date that we're going to have hmm. in advance. I'm not asked to, um, I mean, they do ask me for my comments on things like the trailer before they release it and some other things, but I'm not part of those conversations of general marketing strategy that is their internal process. Um, it's a courtesy that they even include me in any of these discussions, I think. And so uh, if I was part of that conversation, I, of course, would have raised flags and said, hey, I didn't know any of this. I didn't know you weren't being or you or any journalist wasn't getting access the way we assumed it was. I'm not aware of the um, of I only am aware of what I see like any fan so i saw billboards in season one i didn't see billboards in season two and i said hey are we going to get a billboard in season two and somebody said i don't think so and that's it that's the end of the conversation 
but you know the real the world is different in 2022 november than it was in july of 2020 mm. when warrior nun season one came out we were in a wasteland <laughs> of content that because of covid and because a lot of shows couldn't get out in time because they were interrupted or whatnot there was very little competition for warrior nun in and it was i think july 4th weekend in 2020 i mean you couldn't have asked for a better release for an unknown show a show that was uh you know different uh genre show on a, a hot weekend in the middle of a summer where most shows that should have been out weren't out so we had kind of this lovely moment of luck uh, and in a bad luck in a global bad luck situation that allowed warrior nun i think to grab a lot of eyeballs everywhere mm. and then in season two we did not have that luck we had the bad luck of being delayed because of covid in terms of season two's production of the release being pushed into the fall instead of the summer and of other shows many 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 other shows big shows like wednesday the crown in 1899 all coming out at the same time mm. that we had to share now that space well that's netflix's prerogative i don't i can't mm. tell them when to their shows on it's absolutely their business model and they know what they're gaining and losing as a result of these decisions and that's way beyond my my pay grade and i'm not interested in being an expert in that i'm much better at making shows than i am at programming them however i do feel like if you were saying to me if you're comparing season one and season two in terms of how the show performed there was no way we could perform as well as season one i don't think just because of the nature of the universe we were being released into. I mean, we had such a, lo a lovely shining moment in season one. And I think because there was very little content coming out that we got an additional press push, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, perhaps also because a lot of the people at Netflix aren't the same people they were then, we just didn't have someone who loved the show as much. I don't mm -hmm. know, I don't know any of these I can't answer your questions about this. Yeah. They give me the data, and the data is season two did not perform at the same level that season one did. Mm. And that I'm, ultimately was the reason I was given for its cancellation. I have to accept that, and I have to believe that. Now, does that mean that the fans can't get Netflix to reverse their decision? I would never say that. I would never say <laughs> that's not possible, because I don't know. I'm not this person who knows how things work. I'm just an outsider like everyone else. Mm. And um, and they did it with Sense8. That's proof that it can happen. So who am I to say that it can't happen with Warrior Nun? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be just like everyone else, watching these guys launch um, this amazing uh, campaign and and hope for the best for myself, for the show, and for the fans more than anyone, uh, because I definitely want the show's uh, I want the show to have the opportunity to continue and tell the story now. That said, if it doesn't work out with Netflix or another streaming service, are there other ways to continue the story? I believe there are, certainly. And of course, there's the possibility of a feature film, there's a possibility of other media, of animation maybe, of, of, um, of uh, graphic novel, where, we saw, where all this started. I don't know. I mean, that's the great thing about this kind of process is it's no one can say definitively this can't happen because um, mm. nobody knows definitively it's 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 wonderful that way so mm. keep hope alive yeah keep it alive <laughs> i mean i've got to say when it was cancelled um i was gutted um it was funny actually i was interviewing david hater again and uh halfway through well he messaged me after the interview to say that halfway through the interview he got a text message from you <laughs> yeah i texted i texted him not knowing he was being interviewed poor guy <laughs> I, I i feel terrible about that but you know you also have to tell people right away because with netflix they give you kind of a two-hour heads heads up that it's wow. going to go to the uh to the media and so i needed to get the to contact the cast to contact some of the key creatives and uh, the other producers i wanted them to hear it from me not from mm. uh twitter or you know some other uh, mm. vehicle so that's why uh you know that's why i sort of reached out because i think i think it was a two or three hours head start they gave us to let let everyone know it's not much. i mean i mean from a cancellation point of view i mean there's there is a load of shows that have been cancelled i mean i think 160 
uh, last year. And then obviously we get the news of Snowpiercer now uh, not showing season four on TNT. Now, they're now looking for another streaming platform as well. I mean, do you think going forwards this is going to change the way that shows are written with the risk of them being cancelled uh, in the way of clo- um, closing yeah. them each each season? I don't know. I mean, I think it'll be on the in the back of people's mind, people like myself who create shows, you know, I think it'll be in the back of our mind for sure that this is the new the new order. <laughs> um, I think it'll change the way deals are structured, too, in the sense that, you know, I mean, I personally think that, you know, the amount of time and effort you put into making a season of television, it's unbelievable i mean you have no life you have no ability to live a normal life when you're making a tv show so to do all that work and think that it's never going to be seen by anyone for me would just be you know uh the worst possible scenario for not just for myself but for the the people i i hire and so i don't want to be in that position you know if there's a way to avoid it i'll find a way to avoid it contractually or financially i don't know i mean I, maybe there isn't a way to avoid it. I think maybe we're in a new era where these are the, the new realities, but certainly um, it'll be probably something that gets brought up a lot more in the writing room in terms of how stories unfold and how um, we approach the long game, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. But that said, you never know. Maybe you'll be, maybe I'll be on a show like this is us or the last of us. Um, mm-hmm. And Epic. <laughs> which will which will go on probably for you know a dozen years if if we're lucky and that's you know so you know there's always the potential of either end of that uh, mm. spectrum right mm. but yeah yeah it's it's, <laughs> it's what what can I say this is my job we're talking about so it's it's messed up when yeah you talk about cancellations and things uh, I have to now find a new way to um, to earn money. You well, know, it's not just the show; it's my livelihood. Mm, I mean, we—I—I um, I, I threw it out to the World Wide Web um, questions for you, and I've got a few uh, fan questions. And there was one fan that straight away answered within seconds of me putting the post post up. Um, his name is Tristan. I don't know if you know him, uh, but <laughs> but he's put okay. Here's mine. If you had to do a spin-off of a warrior nun character, who would it be, and why Vincent? <laughs> Well, because Tristan is the best. <laughs> He's just so <laughs> lovely. Such a good actor. Um, I get to practice my French with him because he speaks French perfectly and I don't, so I get to practice with him. Uh, no, tr- I love Tristan. And I would love to do anything with him. I mean, I'll, trust me, I'll be working with Tristan again. Guaranteed. <laughs> Whether it's the next version of Warrior Nun or a season of Warrior Nun, or if it's something else, um, yeah, he's one of those actors I can't, I can't avoid anymore. And then we've got another quest question here. I'll read this out because it's quite small on the screen. Um, but it says, Uncle Simon, um, can you please explain the line below uh, when, she, when Beatrice says, be free? Um, you, know, you know, can you elaborate on what she, she means by that line uh, in detail? Um, yeah, I have so many nieces now, Brian. Did you re- did you know how many you, nieces you, I have? You've got thousands. You've got thousands. I have th- tens of thousands of nieces um, and nephews too. <laughs> I I would say that Beatrice's be free line. Well, let's just say when I wrote that line, I was trying to make the line mean more than just one thing. I think it was designed to be kind of encapsulate the whole journey of Ava's life, which had been a series of cells, you know, a series of traps, a series of obligations, a series of, of um, expectations. And um, so on the one hand, Beatrice, who knew that, wanted Ava to be free of all those mm. cages and obligations and expectations, because that was ultimately something that Ava had never asked for in her life. She'd never asked to be injured. She'd never asked to be kept in that orphanage. She'd never asked to be um, get the halo. She'd never asked to be part of the OCS. She never asked to be the warrior nun. And so she was, in, in, in essence, uh, a servant of a greater plan that she was not a part of. 
I think Beatrice wanted her to be free of that as well. And that's what love is. You know, love is, mm. is, is knowing that someone is, needs something and you can give it to them. And, and Beatrice probably also knew that the one thing holding Ava back from being free would be Beatrice. So she was giving her permission to say goodbye in a way, I think. Uh, but there's other layers to that. I think there's layers that the audience will read in that are just as valid as my ex my explanation that are probably more meaningful too, that are just as valid. And sometimes when you write these things, you're not trying to be literal. You're trying to, to tap into an esoteric feeling of something larger. So mm. in a weird way, a lot of times I put in lines like that that are deliberately vague or general because I want the audience to write their own version of the reason, not because my version is the last word, because there's more to it than what I'm writing. Or there's more to these characters than I can um, express. So I like that these lines in particular generate other versions that are probably better than my version and just as meaningful, and just as valid, you know. And then our next question is, why didn't we have as many Ava inside thoughts like we did in season, season one um, opposed to season two? Didn't need them. I mean, the, the more we got to know Ava, the less we needed her internal dialogue. That was sort of the, the, the lesson of season one. Less than season one. Season one, we had double the amount of internal dialogue written than we used. We ended up cutting most of it out because mm -hmm. it was redundant. I mean, Alba doesn't need an internal dialogue to tell you what she's thinking or how she feels. And half the time we would watch this, the cuts with her performing the scene and you know, you didn't need the, 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 dial, the words on the audio track. It was obvious how she felt. It was obvious what she was doing. So we just started removing it, removing it, removing it, removing it, removing it. And by the time season two came around, it was seen as something more as a artifact of season one than a necessity for season two. So we used a little at the top just to kind of get us into the mode of the show and, and short, shortcut some of the, the stuff that we had uh, gapped between seasons one and season two and also bring people who might have forgotten what had happened in season one into the show faster. And then if we did use it in season two in, in little ways, it was really for either uh, a comedic effect or an, uh, an editorializing that we felt would just add another layer that was interesting, but it was never meant to be part of the storytelling. And frankly, with Alba, you don't need it. I mean, she's just mm. so good. Mm. Mm. Let, let, her, let her do her thing. And then um, I just wanted to quickly touch on the fans because you mentioned about not getting a billboard for season two. I don't know if you've seen <laughs> well, it on Twitter. <laughs> yes, it is not true. Literally, they will be a billboard. They've been sending flowers, balloon bouquets uh, to all the streaming. And it's just amazing and breathtaking. I mean, what are your thoughts, you know, on the efforts I that they are it. actually doing? I love it. I love it. I mean, this may never happen to me again in my lifetime on a show that I am part of. So to p participate in it in a way that I can be like the fans and just enjoy this journey of affection and effort. It's great. I am, um, and I, I don't feel responsible in a good way. I don't, I don't feel like I'm the, uh, the spokesperson, which is nice. Like I'm used, to, I'm used to being the leader of the show and I don't need to be the leader of this because it's already in great hands and it's mm -hmm. being managed better than I could. Um, and it's a journey that I get to take with the fans on Warrior Nun, which normally I don't get to take. I don't get to be surprised or uh, participate because I'm usually the one behind the scenes, you know, spinning the plate. So this is it's an amazing thing. And it's always for me, I see every every action as an expression of people's love for the show, which means that we did a good job as a team of filmmakers we 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 succeeded so every day it's a reminder that that those two years were not only amazing in the exercise of making the show but they were amazing in what we were able to bring to the fans mm -hmm. and the people who appreciate the show and that's really great i mean that's why i'm kind of enjoying it because i know that i might do i don't know another five or six shows and this won't happen 
And so it's like, this is, I'm sure it will appreciate it. I'm well, sure, I mean, the, the, sure the, campa- the campaign of of trying to save the show, you know, I'm, obviously I don't want to be canceled, you know, again and again and again. <laughs> but the uh, but the idea that the fans rise up like this in a way that uh, is just it's amazing. I'm just in awe. I'm in awe. And every day it's like a Christmas present of just new art and new um, expressions of affection and just all so positive. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I. I really hope that, you know, that miracles happen and that Netflix decides to reverse themselves. Do I think that'll happen? I have no idea. I'm not, I wish I had more insight into the way people think and operate, but I don't. I am an outsider um, uh, from the Netflix organization. I'm not an insider. I, I don't, you know, I don't have access to that and stuff. Mm. I'm a contractor, you know, I, I get hired to do the show and then I'm done. So I wish I could be, I wish I could participate more in this. Um, but I also have to work with Netflix again. I have a movie mm-hmm. with them that um, has nothing to do with Warrior Nun, but I'm working with them as a, as a company, as a producer. I have to respect their decision. I do respect their decision. But at the same time, I also believe the fans are entitled to a voice. And, um, and, um, and you know, I'm thrilled that they care enough about the show that they would make this effort and raise money and do billboards and anything they do i think it's just like it's incredible it is stunning i i, I was on a twitter space the, the other day with i think it was like two thousand um people yeah. and literally it was like listening to a military operation and everyone <laughs> is so you know intelligent and smart and and just they know their stuff they really really do so keep fighting the fight um you know keep you know tweeting instagram and all that jazz because um who knows as you said twi- um netflix could reverse it sensei it could be i mean is there a chance of maybe if they don't uh finishing this story off i mean you did mention obviously a film or animation i mean even like a two episode sort of finish off sort sort of to iron things things off or well i'm there's probably a legal component to this that i am way too stupid to understand um and that, that's why i am not responsible for contracts or anything like that because nobody thinks i'm i should be involved in that sort of thing um but creatively yes of course i have i have ideas about where the story is supposed to, wants to go and i i know that there is a story to tell and i know where the characters are going to go what form that takes is ultimately going to be up to two things the legality of it and the money uh the legality of what is allowed to be done from uh the the contractual point of view of this property that i don't own i don't control but i could i'm a willing servant of um but other people have the legal rights i don't have the legal rights so they will make that determination if there is a legal path to continuing the story that's number one number two would be like who's going to pay for it uh, mm. making any kind of media is inherently expensive. So someone's going to have to take the risk. Who will that be? I, again, I don't know, but I'm a willing servant in that process if it should happen. So like most people, I'm going to end up waiting in a way to find out what these opportunities may be and how they'll present. And then I can participate as a creative person, which is what I do. Um, but how it'll happen uh, ultimately will be up to lawyers and money people and as it always does and that's really where the the success of this will lie it'll be in that process and how that is managed how it is done with you know i would say ultimately with transparency and respect and with um the uh, with the presence of mind to protect you know the uh the the characters in the story in a way that it deserves and so you and I will will uh, will hopefully get to revisit this story. Who knows? In another form, uh, or an, or another uh, chapter down the road. But I, I have no idea what that will look like at this point. Simon, you've been a great guest. Thank you for coming on once again. And who knows? We might meet again. You know, in the near future for season three, um, or a new yeah yeah reincarnation of the story. But Simon, look after yourself. Keep safe and stay super, my friend. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it.